Hey everybody, this is Aaron Harris, host of the Football Odyssey, and today I want to talk to you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. And there are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go and download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Football Odyssey. This is your host, Aaron Harris. Hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. And I hope everyone is enjoying the NFL preseason, if that's something that you do indeed care about as I do. Uh, We're just a few short weeks away from the NFL season kicking off and a shorter time away from the college football season getting underway. That being said, there's still a small window of time left to get some movies in before my weekends are consumed with Steelers football, NFL Red Zone, some college games, and maybe a high school game or two. So today I have another football film review for you, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before, most likely in theaters, but if not, I would imagine certainly on television at some point. And it is from 1979, North Dallas 40, directed by Ted Kotcheff and starring Nick Nolte, Mac Davis, and Dale Hayden, and released by Paramount Pictures. B.A. wants me to adjust to sitting on the bench. Hell, I'll die on the bench. What's the sense of the team winning if I don't survive, huh? You'll survive. (laughs) Really? You know what I do? I pull for the other team, so we'll get behind the B.A. will have to put me in. That's weird. Drop it. There's a theme that runs through all this data, Phil. It's immaturity. Your immaturity. You lack seriousness. B.A., I'm sorry if my immaturity has offended you. Now, honestly, try to change. And when you do start me, I'll make you glad you did. North Dallas 40. If you were moving any slower, you'd be going backwards. Very funny, Elliot. Very funny. Yeah, I'm a very funny guy. <laughs> That's real devotion. You remind me of the magnificent missionaries of history. Shooting cows. Hey, I know, I know. It's not your type of thing. But I happen to be more of a philosopher. I like to mingle with the little people. Nick Nolte and Mac Davis. North Dallas 40. Hey, you girls ever try a quarterback sandwich? Oh, Max, that's gross. It's not gross. <laughs> that's gross. Oh, they got the blood up now. Oh, yeah. It's an old story, boy meets boy. Well, I love happy endings. The difference between good and great is that much. I thought he came from all those funny little pills we took. A bag of marijuana. Maybe you ought to take some vitamins. Well, have some extreme. Well, I'm having chocolate pudding. Breakfast for champions there. Ah! Oh, Too damn much B12. That's why guns are not concentrated. That's concentration, Elliot. Well, I'm just getting to the weird part. The right leg! The weird part? The weird part? Yeah, it gets weird. Paramount Pictures presents a Frank Yablon's production. North Dallas 40. <laughs> Wait till you see the weird part. <laughs> 
Now, like the previous films I've reviewed on the podcast, this was my first time viewing North Dallas 40 after I had sat on my watch list for some time. And I'd often had seen this film listed as one of the greatest football movies of all time. Not that it's a great movie, mind you, but one of the greatest in the genre, which we'll go into later on. And judging from the poster, I had this presumption that this was going to be a sort of screwball comedy movie about a fictional football team. I knew going into this that the Dallas Cowboys were some sort of influence and that maybe this was a parody of quote-unquote America's team, but instead I got something completely different. You know, Instead of getting a comedy like the Burt Reynolds film Semi-Tough, I got this very unsentimental and bitter look at the world of professional football with some skating satire mixed in for a comedic element. And to give you a little bit of a synopsis, the movie right from the get-go opens up with our protagonist, Philly of Elliot, who's played by Nolte, lying in his bed and struggling to get up. You know, he's agonizing as he tries to lift himself up from his side, while also thinking about last night's semifinal game, where he dropped numerous passes, but ultimately catches the game winner for the North Dallas Bulls. But despite his late game heroics, he's notified that he'll be on the bench for the championship game. And his room is littered with empty beer bottles. And once he's up and about, he lights himself a cigarette as he prepares a bath before some of his drunken teammates barge in and bring him on an impromptu cow hunting trip. One of his drunk teammates is the quarterback, Seth Maxwell, who's played by Mac Davis. And it's clear that these two have been through a lot together in the pros and share many of the same anxieties and pain that's come with aging in a young man's game. Uh, but there's some difference in the way that they view their respective roles in the business of football. Now, Elliot is someone whose physical pain and disillusionment with the bureaucracy of professional football has all but ruined the luxury that one receives in Texas playing for the Bulls. While Maxwell, you know, he's hard bitten by the experience in his own right, but he still finds comfort in the celebrity status that includes woman, booze, and drugs. This is all perfectly on display when the team is having a rowdy and obscene party where Maxwell relishes being the life of the party as he waltzes around through the festivities with a girl in each arm, while Elliot walks around completely disinterested, looking sort of aimless, but also looking as if he's searching for someone that he'll recognize, even though every man at the party is a teammate of his. And never at one point does he loosen up or crack a smile. It's just the look of a man who sees through the facade that enchants so many young ballplayers because he now knows what it's like to be at the other end. And throughout the movie, there are scenes that show just how Elliot has reached that point in his career where he's going through the motions. He's interested in playing football, but feels that his efforts are now futile that he's on the bench. Now, there's one scene, for instance, that has Elliot in the office with his head coach, B.A. Strother, who's played by J.D. Sprawlden, whose southern drawl, biblical metaphors, and his interest in new technology for football resembles none other, none other than the Cowboys head coach Tom Landry. And Coach B.A. tells Elliot that he lacks seriousness and that he doesn't put the team's needs and efforts in front of his own individual desires and accomplishments. And Elliot reassures his coach that he'll adjust his attitude, but a scene later when he's in bed with a team executive's girlfriend, he says he'll root for the other team, which we'll see examples of later in the film. And he spends the rest of the week in film sessions in which the coaching staff tries to motivate the players, but often times it falls on deaf ears to anyone who isn't a rookie. You know, film breakdown sessions are the times when no player is safe from scrutiny, even though they won the game. And it seems as if every scene takes place in the locker room or in the weight room involves the players swallowing painkillers or getting injections or knocking back a few beers during ice bath or uh, workout sessions. And it's around this part of the movie that you can clearly see that the story isn't just about Elliot's internal bout with the reality of his circumstances, but rather it's evolving into a movie that shows what it can be like behind the scenes for veterans in a game that's frankly more of a business than it is a game. You know, guys that shouldn't be playing, you know, quote unquote, pop some greenies, as they say, or they take an injection so they can get all numb and ready to go. Um, and by the end of the week, when they're playing the game, you'll find that there is no character transformation. You know, no one on the team really has that light bulb moment, that come to Jesus moment when they figure out why they play the game. Even during the pregame pep talk and prayer, everyone just seems uninterested. 
and those who do show emotion look more bloodthirsty than they are motivated. And by the film's end, there's an interesting final scene where Elliot decides that he's quitting football. And it's a scene that's not completely out of place, as you'll come to find out, but it's one that didn't have enough legs underneath it from the previous scenes or plot points in the movie to make it seem credible. But it's a time when Elliot really seems sure of anything for the first time in the movie. And even in his actions, there doesn't appear to be any catharsis. You know, before the film ends, he runs into Maxwell again. And it really is a fitting way to end the movie because it exemplifies how Maxwell is still trying to play the game, both literally play the game of football, but also figuratively try to play the game in the business sense of professional football, while Elliot simply just walks away from it all. And I'm sure most of you know that the movie is based off a 1973 book um, with the same name by Peter Gent. And if you don't know who Peter Gent is, no one would blame you because he was predominantly a backup wide receiver in his pro football career as a Dallas Cowboy from 1963 to 1968. Although he did play in those memorable Cowboy games like the Ice Bowl or the 1968 NFL Championship game for the right to go to the Super Bowl II that the Packers would ultimately win. So... Right off the bat, you can see the influence that the Cowboys had on the North Dallas Bulls. And some more detailed influences like Seth Maxwell being based on Don Meredith, who, according to IMDb, was actually offered the part of Maxwell in the film. But what's interesting about Peter is that he was a multi-sport athlete growing up. And he did play high school football in his hometown of Bangor, Michigan. But he went to Michigan State um, to play basketball. And he refused to join the Spartan football team, even though the coach had lobbied for him to to come on the team and walk on. And the Cowboys apparently saw something in him to offer him a tryout with the team, which was something that the Cowboys were pioneering in terms of converting athletes from other sports into football. And by now, I think if any of you have ever read books like Out of Their League by David Megacy, or they call it a game by Bernie Parrish, you'll find that this film has the same spirit of those two. Um, I guess you can call them tell-all memoirs, that deconstruct the mythological image of the NFL from the perception of a player on the inside. Now, it's not to say that the experiences in this film are completely identical to the two authors of those books, but it carries the same sentiment of men playing a children's game with dire physical consequences in a corporate environment that sooner or later will discard them when they can't operate at full speed or strength any longer. But what makes Peter's fictional account kind of intriguing compared to the two memoirs is that both Megacy and Parrish had been involved in football for their entire lives and admittingly had this romanticized notion of the game that stayed with them even after they were exposed to the underhandedness of college football before it would dissipate after playing in the NFL. You know, with Gent, as far as I could tell from my research, football was just another sport that he played growing up and had the opportunity to play for money. So it seems as if he's writing a book and co-writing a screenplay from a standpoint that I would still consider interpersonal, but one that definitely comes off as feeling more detached as opposed to disappointed at the reality of what it's like when football is turned into an industry. And Jen would go on to write some other unflattering books, you could say, about pro football, none of which I've read personally, but regardless, it only speaks to the impact that his experience with the Cowboys must have had on him to write a few books about this world that I'm sure resonate with many players in that position. And to that point about players with that sort of down and out veteran status, so to speak, now this is a theme that obviously permeates a lot of sports movies. And watching the film, I was reassured of two things. One, that it's refreshing to see a gritty, down-to-earth football movie that complements, not replaces, but complements biopics or predictable underdog tales of inspiration and teamwork. With that said, the second thing that I was reassured of is that anytime there's a pro football narrative that doesn't fall into these two categories, it's always most likely going to be a narrative about the tragedy of a once great player that's stuck in the past as the game just continues to pass him by. Um, you know, he was once great, but can't keep up any longer because of the punishment he's taken. While his backup, that's projected to be great, or maybe he's an underdog in his own right, pushes him to the side, and our protagonist becomes disillusioned with the business of professional football, and usually disenchanted with the game itself. You know, this is 
obviously an early example of the trope, along with the film I reviewed earlier in the podcast, uh, the Charlton Heston film number one, where he is an aging QB that can't let go of the fact that he's in decline. Any given Sunday, you can argue is more than just this particular trope. Um, you know, actually, you could probably make the argument that the movie is an example of a third common trope of football movies that show just how hedonistic pro football really is. But nonetheless, any given Sunday also has this narrative subplot that drives the story forward as well. So clearly, football and generally sports films often suffer from that lack of originality. And I understand the approach when studios decide to greenlight these same formulaic sports stories. You know, most of them are based on true stories, so there's a built-in audience, and the story is already written, you know, and everybody loves a good rise and fall story. But given this convention, North Dallas 40, I think, adds its own unique flavor for the reason that I mentioned earlier, and that Gent appears to look at football dispassionately. Not dispassionately at pro football or the people involved in pro football, but the actual game itself. You know, the way the Bulls players don't really respond to any sort of sentimental speech or uh, even seemingly have nothing in common with one another aside from the fact that they wear the same uniform and they pop the same painkillers, you know, really captures an almost robotic attitude that I would expect to find, you know, maybe in a losing franchise, let alone one like the Bulls who in this film are playing for a championship. You know, so maybe that's why the theme stands out so much because, you know, it's supposedly telling us that this happens even within the most, you know, prime, prime organizations in pro football which often are franchises that in today's ever-present media environment are ones that we get to know better than some of our own regional teams just because of the amount of retention they receive. And to continue to the point I argued about Jen's seemingly dispassionate stance on the game, you know, I believe it's further made apparent by the fact that there's not a lot of football in this film, you know, far less than any of the other films that I've reviewed on the show. Um, you know, Truthfully, it appears that the amount of football scenes or football action in two minute warning or black Sunday and the Super Bowl disaster thriller episode is greater than the amount shown in this movie. But this is what adds to that dispassionate, unique flavor I referenced earlier. And it's what actually what works in the film that it works in the film's favor because it isn't about the game, but rather the toll that the game takes on the player. You know, the championship game in the movie lasts only between five and seven minutes and there's some short practice sequences and brief flashbacks intercut throughout the movie. But all in all, the game is secondary to the attitudes of the player. And there's even a scene in the movie where one player, played by NFL lineman John Matuzak, has a strong reaction to one of the coaches. And the scene has a lot more energy than any football sequence in the film, which may have been an effort on behalf of the director but at any rate, it really packages the spirit of the movie into a one-minute diatribe that really gets the message across. Hey, Ellie. You look pretty good out there, man. Pretty good. Wish we could say the same thing for you, Joe Bob. You should have studied Weeks' tendencies. Thought I did, Coach. And you don't listen. I we would have won if we... We studied those tendencies. Oh, shit! You never give us anything to bring in the game except your fucking facts and tendencies. To you, it's just a business. But to us, it's still got to be a sport. You're supposed to be a professional. You go out there and oh, play shit. football. shit! We'll work harder than anybody to win. But, man, when we're dead tired in the fourth quarter, winning's got to mean more than just money. You're hired to do a job. Job! Job! I don't want no fucking job. I want to play football, you asshole. I want some feeling. I want some fucking team spirit. This ain't no high school. You don't have to love each other to play. It's just what I mean, you bastard. Every time I call it a game, you call it a business. And every time I call it a business, you call it a game. You and B.A. Oh, and all the rest girl. of you coaches are chicken shit cocksuckers. No feeling for the game at all, man. You'll win, but it'll just be numbers on a scoreboard. Numbers, that's all you care about. Fuck, man, that's not enough for me. I don't have to listen oh, to you. Oh, yes, you freak. fucking do. you got to listen to me for hey. once. Hey. Yeah. All you coaches oh, are oh. chicken shit cocksuckers. You're all chicken shit cocksuckers. God damn you. So just from that clip alone, I think the tone and the theme of the story is well established at this point. And I had to give uh, the director, Todd, uh, Ted Kotcheff, credit for being able to create a world or a universe that the story takes place in. You know, I don't think it's a great movie for a few reasons that I'll discuss in a moment, uh, but Kotcheff really created a good visualization of Jen's story. 
you know, there's a lot of medium shots and close-up shots of Nolte's face that emphasize his displeasure, his grief. And the movie moves along at a pretty good pace. And seeing that the film takes place over the course of eight days, he had plenty of time to balance out Elliot's personal affairs with practices, film breakdowns, you know, front office turmoil that allowed the story to expand as it went along and not get bogged down with just static settings or filler or dialogue. And as far as casting goes, I bought Nolte as a football player who, fun fact, actually did play football when he was in college at Eastern Arizona. He, he was certainly the focal point of the film. He left a memorable performance that was much different than the kind of roles he was playing at that point in his career. It was a character that had a lot of depth, was very multidimensional, and it wasn't just a pretty boy role. You know, personally, I envision him more as a linebacker as opposed to a receiver. Uh, yeah, he had, he had that shaggy hair and that I'm going to rip your head off glare throughout the film that Jack Lambert used to have. But I could buy into him being a receiver too. He, he looks a little like former Oakland Raider Fred Belitnikoff. Um, and Mac Davis too, who debuted as an actor in this movie, did a nice job, especially for his first time on screen. You know, he had a carefree attitude and a more casual persona that complemented a brooding Nolte, but it never took away from the lead character. Even in the supporting scene, even if they didn't have much dialogue, it, it still looked the part, and a few did a really good job of acting as the quote-unquote insane football player who's always ready to snap at any minute. Although Bo Svensson in this movie playing right guard Joe Bob Pretty gets too carried away at times, and I think you'll agree with me when you get 10 minutes into the movie. And, as I mentioned, there's a small role in the film for John Matuzak, a two-time Super Bowl winning defensive end who does a perfect job of conveying the brutish football player without becoming a caricature. Now, where there's good, there's usually bad. But there's really only two things about the movie I disliked. The first being Elliot's love life. When he's at that party early in the film, he meets a woman named Charlotte, who's played by Dale Hayden, and who clearly looks out of place more so than he does at the party. And they strike up this relationship that went from point A to point C, even though there was nothing that happened in point A to make you believe they could just skip to point C right over point B, if that makes any sense. Now, she's clearly in the movie to serve as that armchair psychiatrist for the conflicted man, to play devil's advocate and tell Elliot that you don't need football. You can get satisfaction without all the violence. Look what it's done to you. You know, Feel free to stop me at any point if you've heard this before in hundreds of movies. So she essentially articulates everything we already know, and she's just there to fit a formula without any real purpose. What would have been good, in my opinion, is if Kotcheff and Gent had given Savannah Smith um, Bowers, or Boucher, her character of Joan, a better role as his love interest. You know, she plays the team executive's girlfriend that I mentioned earlier that Elliot was sleeping with. And frankly, you know, she's a beautiful woman in this movie who had better chemistry with Nolte. You know, she has the looks and just enough sensitivity to care about being told how loved she is and showing emotion, but she's also self-aware to know how much Elliot digs her and feeds into that and feels as if she uh, can relate with him. And I understand a storyline like this can make it seem like an episode of, you know, the 80s soap opera Dallas, but it would have added another layer of conflict in the movie, uh, especially th since this is a film with the mood of the player versus management. But maybe when they remake it, they'll keep this in mind. So the second problem I had was with the ending. And I'm not going to go too much into detail to uh, avoid spoilers. But at the end, there's this unexpected meeting between the Bulls front office and a quote unquote league investigator about Elliot's various violations to the morality clause in his contract, which is basically just a plot to get him the hell out of Dallas. And in the investigation or conspiracy, rather, it's only hinted at a couple scenes throughout the movie that you for pretty much forget about by the time we reach the end. But it feels frustrating because that also would have added another dimension to the movie's overall theme of players versus management. And once that scene came on, I was really disappointed that they didn't explore this further and develop it more. And it felt like they had written themselves into a corner after the final game and they had to think of a quick way to give Elliot the appropriate ending. Which I can understand because I've read the ending of the book and I'm not going to spoil it, but it's certainly not one that they would put into a Hollywood film. But I'll just leave it at that because I'm curious to hear what other people think. You know, Nolte ends the film with a great performance, but if this subplot would have been fleshed out, it would have been more rewarding, I believe, for the audience. 
But all in all, I would consider this to be a good movie with some great performances. And most of the reviews that I've read, both from critics of the time and today, would agree. I wouldn't say this is the greatest football movie of all time, as I'm sure some people would argue, but it does stand above a lot of inferior movies in the subgenre. Now, Siskel and Ebert actually reviewed this film on their show, and they came away impressed with Nolte. And Ebert pointed out that a lot of other critics agree with that in this movie, it's set in the world of pro football, but it's not about football. And he's right, because I would imagine by now you've picked up the idea that this is a movie about being a cog in a machine, which many people outside of football can relate with. But given Jen's experience, you can definitely imagine that there's plenty of players that also feel like that. Some players, speaking of, actually at the time of viewing said that everything in the movie happened to one degree or another, or that some of it may have been exaggerated, but it ultimately drives the point across and captures the environment accurately. There were other critics and some players who weren't as high on the film because they, like me, thought they were going to watch a comedy, and then they were, and then there were those who thought the behavior, the atmosphere, and even some of the characters were too cartoonish and didn't offer enough of a nuanced view of the coaches or management, which I can't disagree with, but it's based off a book with a certain perspective, so that's really how you have to approach the movie. For football fans, even though there's very limited game action, I still think you would find it interesting to see, just to get a sense of what pro football, or what, what a pro football team could look like back in the late 70s. And if you're a movie fanatic that doesn't like football, this will definitely be up your alley because it's just as much of a drama as it is a sports movie. And to close off here, there is one documentary that I do want to recommend to everyone that I believe would make a good double feature with this film. And it's called Disposable Heroes, The Other Side of Football from 1985. But on the average, careers in the NFL last only four and a half years. Injuries, age, and fierce competition take their toll. Soon, too soon, these men will be ex-football players. dedicated the better part of their lives to becoming masters of the game. Yet, before their 26th birthday, most will be forced to leave the game forever. I'm straightening them out. I'm stringing them out. There's nothing I can do outside the track. Yeah, I understand that. The thing is, Teddy got hooked down here. Yeah. I had a perfect angle. I told him to widen out when he said it. Well, Theismann back. Looks off to the left, and he fires it off there. Intercepted! Jack Squirrel! Touchdown, Raiders! I don't believe it! Holy Toledo! Each year, a million kids play football in high school. 40,000 in college. But only the best 1,600 make it to the NFL. Virtually all of them learned their dangerous and exotic trade in college, but 74% never received their college degree. Many will enter civilian life with few marketable skills. Most will be plagued with football injuries for the rest of their lives. It's about a 50-minute documentary that was part of the HBO documentary series America Undercover, which focused on contemporary issues, controversial topics, you know, looks inside various American underbellies. Um, and it's a documentary that follows the post-playing career of a few players, most notably Jim Otto, the former center of the Oakland Raiders, and shows what life is like after the game is done for them, both physical challenges and handicaps that come after playing in the NFL, but also what it's like to adjust to the rest of society when you when they don't live by the restricted regimens of coaches or athletic administrators and now have to make decisions independently without so-called caretakers putting everything in place for them, uh, along with finding a group that they belong with when you're out of the exclusive fraternity of professional football players, and finding a post-playing career. I think many of you will find a lot of similar themes with these two films. So give them a watch. Let me know if you agree. 
Uh, North Dallas 40 is streaming on Amazon Prime, and Disposable Heroes is on YouTube. I hope you all enjoy this review, and if you do, if you do decide to give them a watch, reach out through email or social media, and let me know if you agree or disagree with any of my thoughts on these films. Um, until then, thanks again for listening, and take care until next time.